welcome back to the very last lesson, the very last one of the first half of Unit 3. Oh, man. All right, but it is a pretty cool lesson today, and I'm an AP stat guy, so this is right up my alley. 3.7 is sinusoidal function context and data modeling. So they're going to give us some data, and we have to come up with an equation that models that data. Here's uh, the following data set can be modeled by a sinusoidal function. Remember, that could be sine or cosine, but we'll just stick with sine for this example. Use the data to answer each problem below, and the problems want you to know the period, the frequency, the, the midline, the amplitude, all that stuff. All right, so let's just look at the data first. We see that it starts at, at 130, but it goes up, and then there's a maximum. We can't assume that there wasn't a phase shift, right? It could have been moved left or right, so we're not going to assume that the function starts here and goes up to 225, but it does look like 225 is a maximum, right? Because it's going up to this value and then coming down. Now, keep in mind, these are data values, so they're going to be a little bit, there might be a little bit of error involved. Uh, when we find this maximum at 225, we're also going to notice that there's a minimum over here at 50 at 98. So I'll just use a different color. We'll represent that down here as a minimum. And then we're going to keep going. And it looks like there's another maximum over here at 224. So we'll just put that up like this again. And we can kind of visualize what's happening here. We see another minimum, maybe at 102. And then another maximum if we keep going at 227. Notice all of our maximums are approximately the same value. Same thing for our minimums. The last one we can tell for sure is somewhere around here. And so what I'm going to do is use very nice whole numbers. We're going to approximate it. For these maximums, what's a good whole number? Let's just use 225, okay? So we'll say that suppose the max is about 225. And then now look at the mins. What do you think? Looking at those minimum values, I'm going to guess the minimum value should be about, I'm going to use 100 because that's, that's going to make some easy math here. So we have a max of about 225 and we have a minimum value of about uh, 100 here. How's that? I'm trying to draw and talk at the same time. So now what do we have to do? Estimate the period and the frequency and all of that. All right, so what can we do? In between these two values, remember it should be at zero. And in between these two values, it should be at zero. We have a maximum at 20. We have a maximum at 80. Well. That can help us figure out our period right there. If we go from 20 to 80, and that's one full cycle, right? Goes down, comes back up. That's one full cycle right there. That means the period must be about, what do we do? 80 minus 20, 60, right? And of course, once we figure out that the period is 60, we can figure out the frequency. Remember, the frequency is one over the period. So we can write that right here, the frequency must be about one over 60, okay. Now, estimate the vertical shift in the midline. So using the max and min, right? we have a max of 225, a min of 100. We know that the midline is the horizontal line that goes between the max and the min, right? It's right in the center. So to find that out, the midline's gonna equal, let's just add these up and divide by two, right? We can do that. So 225 plus 100, and then we divide by two. What does that give us? 325 divided by two. Easy enough. And we get 162.5 on that. And the last one is estimate the amplitude. Well, the amplitude, remember, is the distance from the minimum to the midline or the midline to the maximum. The easy math is just going uh, the minimum to the midline, right? So that going from 100 to 162.5, the amplitude is about 62.5. Now, can you round that? Well, you can round it off a little bit, I guess. Uh, maybe 63, but I'm just going to leave it as 62.5. Easy enough, right? So we have an idea of what this function looks like. Uh, now they want you to create a sinusoidal function model. So I'm going to start with sine. And this is an estimated equation. It's just supposed to give us approximately what this data set will represent. Some of the points will be above our equation. Some of the points will be below the equation. If the equation is a good fit, if the regression equa equation that we come up with is a good fit, then it should go right through all the points, kind of randomly, you know. So let's use the information we know. We have to find out where the zeros are for the sine function because, as you notice, the sine function's coming down here, up 
to 225, back down again to 98, up to 224, right? I'm looking at the max and the min values. I know between these two values here, between the maximum and uh, the minimum here, right in the middle would be where it would cross zero. And that's gonna be important for us while we write the sine function. So in between would be probably at 35, right? There'd be a zero right here. I'll just put a little Z there. And keep in mind, this is before all of the transformations, before we move it up and down. There's not, it's, it's not gonna be a value of zero here. The original sine function would cross at zero right here. And then it would go down to this minimum and it comes back up. So that would occur right here at 65. So maybe I'll just put another Z right there so we know that it crosses zero right there. And using the same logic, we can just kind of label on this chart where it would cross all the zeros. All right, I'm missing one though, between 80 and 110. So that would be like right here. Well, this is tricky at 95. At 95, there would be a zero, right? Okay, so now what? Well, we understand that the distance from a maximum to that zero is going to be what, 10, 15? So if I go 15 back here at five, this is terrible because I'm using my table as a number line. Uh, but there'd be a zero right there at five. I know that the function crosses right here and then it goes up and then it comes down and it goes up and it comes down, so on and so forth. But I know that right here would be the start of a sine function because it would be at y equals zero before it ascended up here to its maximum point. So I know that a phase shift would occur of five units. It would occur at x equals five. And I'll take a second here and I'll label where all the zeros are. So we're not confused later that at x equals 5, at 35, 65, that's where the sine function would cross the x-axis. And we know now that this function was, it was translated to the right 5 units. So let's start writing our sine function here. We're going to start by just writing good old-fashioned f of x. Everybody loves to start with that. And put an equal sign. And we're going to start all the way in. We know it's sine. And we know there was a phase shift to the right. Now remember everything's opposite. So I'm in, in here, I'm gonna put x minus five. Okay, what else do we need to know to write the sine function? Well, we need to know the amplitude. We know the amplitude, approximately, right? 62.5, that's what we figured out up here. Um, remember, how did we get that amplitude? It goes from the midline to the minimum or the maximum that distance is the amplitude. All right, so now what else do we need? Has this curve been shifted up any? All right, well, let's look at our data here. Uh, the midline's at, where are we at? Uh, 162.5, well, yeah, of course. It's been shifted up 162.5. So we'll put that on there, plus 162.5. And the last thing we need to know is we need to figure out the value of B right here. Now remember, 2 pi over b is going to equal our period. And we know what the period is, don't we? What's the period? We figured that out right here. The period is 60. So 60 is going to equal 2 pi over b, which if I solve it for b, I'm going to get, I can just switch those two, right? So b is going to equal 2 pi over 60. But I can reduce that and make it a little more friendly, right? So that'll just be pi over 30. So the value for b is going to be pi over 30. I'm gonna put that in right here. And you know what, we can't forget some nice parentheses. I'm gonna include another set of parentheses just for fun right here. And I believe that's it, all right? Why don't we pause the video and see if you can come up with a cosine function. It's very similar, maybe you wanna start, look, I'll give you a head start. The phase shift to the right would be right here. Cosine starts at the maximum, right? So you wanna start right here. There's gonna be a phase shift to the right of 20 units. Go ahead and write a cosine function uh, for the same set of data. Pause the video, go. Okay, what did you come up with? Here's what I came up with. 62.5 times the cosine, pi over 30. That wouldn't change, right? Because it has the same period. Uh, the only thing that changes really is on the in inside of that function because we have a different phase shift and we're using cosine, of course. Okay, so on to number five. Using a calculator, find a sinusoidal model from the given data set. This is going to be more precise than just our eyeballs are doing it, right? So your answer should look similar to our estimate in part D. Okay, by part D, I think we mean four up here. 
So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to bring out our calculator, and this is TI-84, as you know. And I'm going to go through some things right now just to clear things out. I'm going to do second memory, and I'm going to clear all my lists to make sure they're empty. And then I'm going to put the data into the calculator. So we go to the data set. Remember, we want to put the X values in L1 and probably the Y values in L2. And when I'm looking at the data, the Y values you're going to have to type in. But those X values, I think it's time to bring up the calculator trick of the day. Brought to you by Sigma Serial. Waking you up when your mornings don't add up since the 10th century. Here we go. The trick of the day. We're going to hit stat. And we're going to hit enter. And that's going to bring us into our list, which we cleared out, right? Now, I want to start at zero and go to 190. So you can type that in if you want to, but check out this trick. If you go up into the heading, there's a function in your calculator under list here. We got to go over to the ops, and it will say sequence. So the expression, let's put in an x. The variable will be an x. And then we start at the minimum value, which is zero, and we go all the way up to 190 counting by tens. That's how this expression works, uh, or this function works. If you hit paste, check that out. It goes all the way down, and it'll stop at 190, and that saved us a whole bunch of time. But we gotta type in the other ones. Okay, I think I got it all in there. So now what do we have to do? We have to create a function. Oop, not too further. Uh, we're just gonna use the calculator, as we said, to create this function. And to do that, I like to go to the home screen, which means we quit. And we're gonna hit stat. We're gonna to go to the right to calculate. And we wanna calculate a regression. So we're gonna look at all of our choices. I like to scroll up when we have to do this one. And if you notice, mine is choice C. It says a sinusoidal regression. Let's do that. Let's hit enter. Now it's gonna ask you, how many iterations do we have? And so to figure that out, they're asking how many curves do we have? Let's look at our data here. How many maxes do you see? How many mins do you see? We see about three. So I'm gonna leave three there. We put our X values in L1. And let's see, our Y values are in L2. The period, we figured that out. That was 60, right? So we can type that in. Now, storing the regression equation. That is always something I recommend doing. Uh, let's store it in case we wanna work with it later. We can hit VARS. We go over to the right and it says Y variables, choose choice one. And then this will store the equation in Y1 for us. And then we're going to calculate it. Cross your fingers. Boom. Now, of course, they're giving us all the coefficients of this equation here. A times the sine of B, X plus B plus C. But notice, there's no parentheses there. So this has been, that value B has been distributed. So it might look a little different than the one we have in our example. But let's write this equation down. And so here we get f of x equals 55.6 times the sine of 0.105x minus 0.480 plus 156.089. Let's check that out. Now, how close is it? Well, 62.5 and 55.6, it's not bad. Remember, these are estimations. They're used to estimate. So if we were to actually plot this all out and look at it, oh, wow, I can do that. I'll show you. You don't have to do it, but I'll do it to plot this I'll just go up into my y equals notice the equations there I'm gonna go turn plot plot one on and if you hit zoom nine then everything will look real good check that out I think all those points in the middle kind of sandwiching it pulls that amplitude down a little bit I'm not sure why our amplitude's a little bit lower but again remember it's just an equation that estimates the data and that's pretty good I mean that's a pretty good estimate right there uh, keep in mind that pi over 30 that we had above has been distributed so if I actually calculated you know, pi over 30 times five. Let's do that real quick to see what we get. So there's a, you know, you got a pi button on here. So pi over 30, and then we'll just multiply that times five, right? So doing that will give us 0.52 and we get 0.48. So it's close, right? And then our, you know, facia, or our translation up here, it's pretty close to what we had. what did we get? 162.5 and this is 156. So your calculator can help you kind of estimate these, but you should be able to, you know, look at it and come up with an equation without a calculator as well. Now, there are a lot of different types of putting this type of skill into practice. That's why your test prep is so large. This is it for this video. Good luck on the test prep. Your master check is going to be mainly these type of questions right here, the uh, basic skills of looking at the table and being able to come up with an equation. So that's all I got for today. That, that's it. And we're done with the first half of Unit 3. Good luck to you on that and your test. This is Mr. Kelly. Remember, one last time here. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. See you.